Hello, my name is Leslie Aberton and this is my longer than average short story called Females. Carol had been off work on an extended anniversary weekend for the last three days. Her hotel visit had been amazing, though they'd rarely left the building. So busy were they at the gym, the swimming pool, the restaurants, and later in their reclaiming of intimacy in a quite extravagant suite of rooms. It had been brilliant, but she was refreshed now and was glad to be back at work, just as she always was. Her fingernails skimmed down the list of today's appointments and stopped when she reached Joanne at 1.30. Well, she was usually glad to get back to work. The day suddenly seemed too long and too difficult. Within Carol's place of work, the feminising centre, respect for the customers stroke clients stroke dressers, however they preferred to be addressed, was paramount. Arriving at the centre was often one of the boldest steps a man could take. It could also lead to a newfound vulnerability, confusion, embarrassment and many other issues, especially for first-timers. And for this reason, their staff training handbook insisted on courtesy, kindness, professionalism and that assistants refer to pre-dressed customers as he and fully female-dressed customers as she, unless, of course, the customer requested otherwise. It was a rule easily remembered for all their clients, even for Jerry Stroke Geraldine, a six-foot-four, butch, clumpy-footed, wide-shouldered, pot-bellied bloke. Carol adored him, and the feeling was reciprocated. Carol respected a customer's space, their need to dress, their desire to appear traditionally feminine, and to attire themselves in a particular way, even though, to the rest of society at large, the vast majority would not have passed as female. That was not the point. Indeed, for many of her customers, it was completely irrelevant. And back to Joanne? Well... He was all right when he arrived through the door and while choosing clothes and chatting about his life. Carol could cope with that. But once dressed as a woman, made up and bewigged, Joanne suddenly became a total pain in the arse. She could apply all kinds of labels, demanding, aggressive and difficult and complaining about everything not being quite right. The foundation was too dark, the bodice too stretched and the blonde fringe was too long. Joanne's list of complaints seemed never-ending sometimes. Sure, it had been easier when Joanne had been younger and slimmer, but now as bad health and stress took their toll, prescription drugs, especially the steroids, were causing no end of difficulty. Joanne's face and body were bloated, almost beyond recognition, making it impossible to fit her into anything flattering. And of course, the favourites... Those bridal gowns and corseted garments with lace and tight sleeves were even more impossible, utterly impossible. Carol knew from experience that virtually nothing in the place fit any more. And Joanne, once dressed, would have plenty to say about that fact. In addition, Joanne's feet, a broad size 11, would normally have been all right. The centre shoes accommodated up to a generous size 13, but now swollen ankles and insteps made them impossible to fit too. And virtually nobody, no matter how skilled a makeup artist they were, would easily be able to work on that skin and those puffy cheeks. It was always a struggle for Carol, and the difficulty had increased each time Joanne visited. Carol tried to like Joanne, she really did, and she understood why the monthly visits to the feminising centre was so important to both the male and female presenting self. Carol always tried her best with each and every one of their clients, but Joanne had become a trial. Carol now understood a little of what her dad had meant when he said, you can't fit a quart into a pint pot. At least Carol was working alongside one of her favourite colleagues that day. Pauline was wonderful. She could take an ordinary man, cubicle him for an hour and turn him into a smouldering Sophia Loren. Carol, on the other hand, specialised in the more homely look, the housewifey perms, the M&S skirt suits and the lightly tailored shirt dresses. She was much beloved by the men who wanted the look of housefrows, grandmothers and office workers rather than the stars of stage and screen. A few of her regular customers broke the usual mode. One delightful old gentleman, deep in mourning, would bring along his dead wife's clothing, including her wedding dress. She loved her job. She loved her customers too, by and large. All the variations on stereotypical femininity had their devotees. Some clients chose the same outfit and same look each time. 
others chopped and changed. Of course, the bridal option was most expensive and took the longest time to achieve, but comparatively few wanted it. Office worker and siren were the two most popular looks by a long way. Carol heard the activation of the entry keypad and Pauline pushed her way through the entrance door. The centre's assistants were both looking smart today. Their outfits were immaculate. Though they were uniforms of a sort, it was obvious that they had been chosen carefully to flatter each woman. Their cleavage-enhancing blouses were just the right blend of tarty and classy, as were the knee-length skirts, the elegant high heels, and the beautifully made-up faces of all the employees. And they didn't just look good, they worked hard too. Counselor, beautician, makeup artist, costumier, photographer and companion. Their jobs were complex, but ultimately immensely satisfying. Hiya, Carol welcomed Pauline. How's tricks? Joanne's here today at one thirty. She pulled her face. Pauline joined her. Oh my, poor you. Well, at least you have a quiet morning on your first day back after holes. Only one appointment with Clementine. I like Clementine. Last time we took loads of photographs, smoked about 15 fags each and both had a good sob. Mmm, agreed Carol. She felt the same, but her mind was elsewhere. With her husband, with the hotel they'd stayed in, and with the knowledge that soon she'd be informing the owner of the feminising centre that she was pregnant and would be leaving in a few months. Not for a maternity break, but for good. She was dreading that. But meanwhile, on with the day. Clementine was always early, always polite, and always ultra-easy to care for. Carol was not dreading that appointment. And as expected when Clementine arrived, things were easy. This time, the choice of outfit was a bottle green off-the-shoulder gown. Carol had understanding of all the men who came to their little centre. Some revelled in the change from their usual masculinity and didn't want to ever change back. Others were pre-op, hormonal and delighted in their new sensitivity. Some were delicate and stylish. Some had skin like silk. Some were easy and unchallenging, passable as women, and a few were even gorgeous when pampered and preened. Clementine was easy, sweet and quietly chatty, serene even, and Carol liked that very much. But others, like Joanne, were rough and coarse in all ways. Carol knew she must treat all their customers the same, but Joanne? She was a challenge and a half. She found herself wishing that all her customers were like Clementine. After chatting to a dressed and made-up Clementine about her college course, the clothes she'd recently bought from New Look, a white blouse with diamante trim and a long swishing skirt in a lovely midnight blue satin, Carol had photographed her, shared another coffee, repaired the paint on her nails, then gone through the whole process in reverse. By the time Carol had affectionately hugged Mark goodbye, it was with a real sense of connection. Clementine really was one of those customers who arrived as Mark, became Clementine, then left as Mark again. Comfortable and modest in both modes, he was a joy to spend time with. Carol wolfed down her sandwich, only half an hour till Joanne. She wished she knew why Joanne was different. It wasn't as if Joe stroke Joanne was their only coarse and rude client, the only person for whom fitting was an issue, or the only one who arrived early and stayed late but still insisted on paying the minimum fee. Joanne wasn't even the only client who combined all these characteristics and more. But somehow, as Joanne the dressed woman, she made Carol uneasy. Of course it was impossible to get along with everybody, and there were bound to be personality differences, but it was more than that. With Joanne there seemed to be a kind of instability, or perhaps intensity, which not a single one of their other customers seemed to have. Thank goodness, or she wouldn't have continued working here as long as she had. She'd had seven years, had met so many people and had so many mainly fantastic experiences. Joe's face appeared in front of Carol, who jumped in surprise. Carol hadn't even heard the door open, the bell ring or even been aware of footsteps till the burly man in tweed suit and hunting hat was positioned directly in front of her. Fortunately this time, Carol had a counter to separate them. She always felt more comfortable when both Joe and Joanne were on the other side of some form of barrier. Pauline came out of the office. Hello, Joe, she said chirpily, while casting a concerned glance at Carol. Carol, love, I'm free this afternoon. Would you appreciate some company, you and Joanne? Carol's expression told a definite yes, but Joe's face said no. 
Carol had to respect that. It's OK, she replied. I'm sure we'll have a lovely afternoon. Come on, Joe, let me have your jacket. It's time for the costuming room. As they walked along the short passage to the windowless, fluorescently lit costuming room, Carol was acutely aware of Joe's presence behind her. She was also acutely aware that Joe's weight had increased again. There was a good chance that not a single one of their stock outfits would fit. There wasn't anything she could think of that would cover the tummy area, except perhaps one of the elasticated skirts, and she knew that Joanne would be disappointed in that. How would Carol break the news? Arriving in the costuming room, Carol switched on the light. Take a seat, she said to Joe, indicating the red throne-like chair in the corner. It was her job to do the carrying and to allow customer browsing, but preferably only from a distance. Assistants treated the customers as royalty. What would you like today? A gown? A business suit? Bridal? Scanning the twenty or so rails, she knew that whatever category Joe chose, there would be trouble. I'm not sure. I think I've put on a little, you know, the steroids. I don't think anything will fit. Remember last time, Carol, we had problems, didn't we? And I'm even bigger now. Carol was stopped in her tracks. Self-aware? Joe? The two didn't go together. This was the first time she'd heard Joe speak this way. Yes, perhaps a little, she said. She couldn't lie. Yes, I believe steroids are quite problematic like that. It's not just the steroids, it's me. I can't stop comfort eating, comfort drinking. I've been miserable. Joe's face told the story of a person who was certainly not happy and was in fact on the point of tears. Carol offered a tissue and an understanding smile. Both were sincerely offered. This certainly was a new Joe stroke Joanne. Do you want to talk about it? Talking was part of her job and one that Carol found satisfying, especially as many of their clients needed to talk. It seemed crucial to the whole experience. It was as if the opening up process, which included their dressing and their makeup, also opened up something else in their psyches. Something more contemplative, self-knowing and sensitive. Carol found that a side effect of this part of her job was that hearing about other people's lives helped to put her own into greater perspective. She wasn't miserable or confused, and neither did she prefer to dress in clothing usual for the opposite gender. Life for her was easy in that regard, but... Joe was staring, blank and intense, and ready to say something. Usually Joe wouldn't talk till the transformation to Joanne was complete, and she was ready to face the world as a woman. Today was obviously different. My wife found out about all this, Joe blurted out. She said it's Joanne or her. She can't stand to be second woman in the relationship. Oh, said Carol, knowing from experience that the situation was nothing new. Plenty of the other halves, whether gay or straight, had difficulty coming to terms, at least at first, with their partner's needs. She wants a divorce if I carry on. She's embarrassed and ashamed. She doesn't get it. So what happens next? She knows I'm here. She wants me to kill Joanne. She forced my hand, told me today has to be the last outing for her. Joe rubbed at his eyes with the tissue. Carol was glad they weren't at makeup stage yet. It was a good time to cry. And I did think I might just hibernate her for a while. Give me a chance to think, you know. The missus will be a right cow about it, though, whatever I decide. She isn't very understanding, you know. Not forgiving or tolerant. Joe sighed. Carol knew it wasn't that easy. The man who called himself Joanne would need to be very protective of himself and find other releases if this femininity was suddenly lost to him. Clearly the comfort, eating and drinking went some way to help Joe to become more at home with himself, but it wasn't enough to stop Joanne from needing to surface. Carol suddenly realised, with shame, why Joe and Joanne were usually so challenging. They were difficult because it mattered so much. That's difficult for you, Carol said. Shall we make it a good one, then? Let's make it special. Ruefully, Joe agreed and chose the largest, most garish outfit available. It was the only one that had a chance of fitting. Next, it was time for the walk to what regulars called the magic room. Wigs and makeup could transform all but the most unwilling and unimaginative. Joe started out with Carol behind. Shoes, remembered Carol. We've forgotten them. I'll just nip back. I've brought my own, Joe said. 
couldn't get anything to fit last time. That was true, but Carol had never credited Joe with that awareness or acceptance. As each second passed, it was clear that Joe was a different person, though Carol was fairly sure that this person wasn't the act. It was the previous Joe, stroke Joanne, the surly, cocky, rude person who was the faker. The whole experience was unsettling, but at least Carol didn't feel her usual unease anymore. What she felt today, with Joe, was something more akin to uneasy friendship, combined with compassion. It wasn't just the usual compassion expressed by one human towards another, irrespective of differences, simply as a result of their shared humanity. No, this compassion was based on understanding and appreciation, empathy, friendship. Carol knew that she was going to step out of her own comfort zone today in order to help Joanne emerge exactly right. It didn't take long, but it wasn't an easy process. The corsetry, the silicon breasts with responsive nipples, the visit to the wig studio, jewellery, all were processes that the pair of them had been through many, many times before. But things were different today. If this was to be Joanne's last meeting with Carol, then this would have to be Carol's finest work. The makeup was always one of the most time-consuming parts of a makeover and was taking more than the expected while. As Carol blended and fretted, the gradually emerging Joanne talked, prattling about soap operas, the weather, holidays, until, just awaiting her wig, she slowed to silence. And then, I think I can do it, you know. I can't imagine how I'll survive, but I think I can manage. You mean without Joanne? I mean, there was a long sigh. I mean, I will have to learn to manage without my wife. I can't give up Joanne. The missus can have her divorce. I can give her up, but not Joanne. I can't give her up. She's me. Then Joanne looked at Carol directly through the mirror's reflective filter. Her face suddenly transformed and softened in the mirror, and she had the air of a voluptuous doll, overly glamorous and far too brightly dressed, with makeup necessarily too thick and mask like. Carol had been working in the studios for seven years, and yet had never understood. Not properly, not till that moment. She saw the clients, and she made them beautiful as best she could. She gave them different styles, exotic, homely, whatever. And then she helped them turn back again and to re-transform into the person they started the day as. She hadn't properly understood. But then, looking at Joanne, Carol knew. You're never going back, are you, to the man you were? I'm not. Or your wife. I've already written the letter, but wasn't sure about sending it till now. I'm posting it when I leave here. She's not expecting me home for a couple of days. She knows I've gone away to think... She'll get the letter tomorrow, and then the constant calls and texts will begin. And where will you go? Have you got somewhere to go? I've a friend, another dresser. She'll put me up, help me out. Will you ever go back, Joanne? I mean, to the man you were and to your family. I can't. My wife doesn't understand. She's freaked out. My letter says I'll be in touch and will send plenty of money, but that will have to be it for now. I know she might soften in time, but I doubt it. And I can't be any less or any more than who I'm what I need to be. I know. So what do I do with your trousers and your man clothes? Keep them. Burn them. I don't need them anymore. I'll have to charge you for today, as usual. I'm sorry. The breasts, the corsetry, and for the clothes you're taking. Everything. Carol was apologetic, but it had to be said. I know, Joanne said. That's fine. I've plenty of money. That's never been an issue. Suddenly, Carol felt protective of this large, indelicate person who had always caused her such hassle and upset with tantrums, moods and awkwardness. Wouldn't you like to see if we can find an outfit that's a little more subtle for streetwear, even if it means just waiting a little while so I can let out some seams? I'm fine. Thanks, Carol. At least this way, the young lads who stare at me whenever I'm dressed, they'll really have something to stare at. So Carol took Joanne's money and hugged her goodbye. That was usual. But this time it was real, not forced or contrived. Carol was inspired. She saw Joanne to her car and helped her into it. I wish you luck, Carol told her. 
You too, she said, with the baby. How did you know? She hadn't told anybody yet, not even her husband, and it definitely wasn't showing. Feminine intuition, Joanne said, with a slow, sad smile, patting Carol's tummy. See you in a month or so. I'll nip in to see the scan picture. Feminine intuition, Carol thought. Yes, indeed. I could do with a bit more of that.